regulatory issues. Is the legal and regulatory environment conducive to the adoption of cloud, or to what extent does it offer, uh, offer barriers? So, again, in the BSA survey, Brazil in terms of its cloud readiness, came towards the bottom because its public procurement policy is very much uh, targeting, ensuring that companies that provide cloud services to to public authorities have to be located in Brazil. Now, there may be very good public policy reasons for doing that, but clearly that, in terms of adopting and taking advantage of cloud as 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 a technology, is a potential obstacle because the top providers of cloud services are are US companies and they have the economies of scale that can, can offer services to, 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 to people around the world at a cost base much lower than perhaps some domestic providers. And the, far, the final example is the, the ITU. Uh, the in- International Telecommunications Union uh, has issued in, in October some, some best practice guidelines for telecoms regulators. So the ITU is saying to telecoms regulators, if you want to be part of uh, uh, creating a regulatory environment that facilitates the cloud, then these are some of the things that you need to be concerned with. So that's the the general framework that that, uh, I want to couch my my comments. But I'm concerned with traditional law, I'm I'm concerned with regulation, and I'm also concerned with contractual agreements, self-regulation if you like. Because one uh, part of the work that we've been doing over the past three years at, uh, at Queen Mary has been looking at the contractual trends within the cloud market as, as it has emerged, as we have seen larger entities negotiating with cloud service providers. We have been trying to monitor and evaluate those developments to see what sort of uh, trends and, and, and issues ha- ha- have arisen. So the project... Uh, is the Cloud Legal Project. Uh, As I said, we started in September uh, 2009, so we've just finished. Uh, Finishing as a project is always a great feeling. Uh, And the purpose behind the project was the first bullet, really. It's about reducing legal and regulatory uncertainty. Uh, And this is a lot of the work that we do at the centre, is debunking myths, essentially. Uh, with the emergence of new technologies, and Maeve will know this as, as, well as, as well as I, people raise problems, obstacles. You can't utilise this technology, or this technology gives rise to particular problems. Uh, document image processing systems, when they emerged in the, uh, in the, uh, the 1980s, um, the problem with document Im- image processing systems was evidence. You can't, you can't get rid of your paper because electronic evidence does not have the same evidential value as uh, traditional original documents. And, and part of our research was about undermining that myth, showing industry, showing uh, those that wanted to adopt such technology that that wasn't really the case, that the, 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 the law doesn't need to act as a bo- an obstacle, that there needs to be clarity, and through clarity uh, we can facilitate market development. So we try to develop a whole series of research strands, you know, the sorts of things that researchers are supposed to do. We're supposed to thought leadership. I'm still trying to you know, push back the boundaries of knowledge. I can never find them, but I, I know they're out there somewhere. Um, uh, and also draft scholarly but also practical papers. The Centre for Commercial Law Studies, which was set up in 1980 by uh, Professor Sir Roy Good, was designed specifically to bridge that gap between commercial law and traditional academic law. There doesn't need to be a difference. And IT law is one of those great examples, and and, and hopefully John would agree with me, where the difference between academic study and and legal practice isn't necessarily that great because clients are coming to John or come to me at Baker & McKenzie and ask questions about how the law is developing how this emerging technology would be treated. And it's a very, it's, a, it's quite an academic approach in the area of IT law often, trying to, to meet some of these challenges. So we've produced uh, a number of papers. Again, that's kind of what we do as academics. Um, uh, and we've produced, or we've got 10 published papers and we've got two forthcoming. And what I want to talk about is some of the, the results of, of, of that research. Um, but of course, again, 
we want to have an impact. Um, and there's no point in just writing for the sake of it. We, we, we've been trying to have an impact. And uh, we've contributed already to the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, our thoughts on cloud computing, the ITU. The, the, the guidelines were developed in part by uh, ourselves, the Commission, uh, the G Cloud. We've, we've tried to directly bring the results of our IT uh, research into, uh, into, into practice. So, what sort of issues does cloud raise as challenges? Well, a range of different issues, and I'm, I can only mention really a few of them now, but uh, security and trust is an obvious one. If I place my data in the cloud, it is both outside of my organisation, and often it's also outside of the jurisdiction in which I reside. And that worries me. That worries me because of the dependency I have by giving my data, my, my highly valuable commercial data, my intellectual property, whatever the, the, the data or the application or the resource, I place it in the cloud and it is now outside of my organisation. And that raises inevitable security concerns for all types of business, but in particular for the public sector. Again, if the government, if government departments are going to embrace the cloud, placing their data remotely, remotely from the organisation, remotely outside the jurisdiction is a concern. And so one of the greatest issues that, that, that arises with regard to cloud is this question of how can I satisfy my concerns in respect of security, in respect of trust, in respect of reliability. And part of that has a regulatory aspect. If I'm a bank, and I know John's going to talk about this, if I'm a bank and I want to outsource, in the UK the Financial Services Authority has specific guidance about the obligations that the bank has to ensure the security of that data when outsourced to another party. And in a cloud environment, that same issue arises, whether it be personal information, whether it be financial data, whatever the, the information is, the concern is... Once that data is placed in the cloud, how do we know that I can continue to meet my compliance obligations? How can I continue to ensure the security and the privacy of your information? And we hear a lot about cloud computing in terms of, of software as a service, in terms of, of platform as a service, and, and Swerve is uh, going to be talking about that, that later, and, and infrastructure as a service. One of the things that we've, we came across in our research is there is an increasing demand really for what we call compliance as a service, where I place my data in the cloud and I need to show either to, to my board, to my directors, or I need to show to a regulator, a third party, or my customers, that when I place that data in the cloud, it continues to be secure, that my business continues to have reliable access to the data upon which my business is dependent, and that I have trust that by shifting my data and applications out of the organisation, that the businesses with whom I place that information will continue to be in existence. And of course, that is not an inevitability. We did a survey of 32 cloud providers in 2009, of which two have already disappeared. No longer in existence. One, it appeared, was one guy with two <coughs> Mac MacBooks. You know, the cloud is not always transparent. The cloud is quite often opaque. So knowing who is providing the underlying infrastructure for that cloud service is going to be a question of trust. So one of the issues, and I'm going to come back to this, is this question of, of compliance as a service, where we depend on resources remote from the organisation, remote from the jurisdiction. How do we ensure compliance? Second issue, connectivity. Again, we talk about cloud and it's about storing data in this environment, this, this uh, virtualised environment, sitting on large server farms, whether near Dublin or whether they're in, in, in Luxembourg or whether they're in the United States. We don't know where the data is, but it's out there somewhere. But of course, to get out there is a question of connectivity. And that's increasingly a question of, of having sufficient bandwidth. 
it is not feasible to shift any substantial part of your data or applications into the cloud environment unless you have robust communications networks. And of course, in many parts of the world, we are a long way from robust communications networks. And therefore, cloud development is going to be constrained in part by the rollout of <coughs> broadband connectivity, whether it be wire or wireless, we still have some way to go. We all know from our daily experience, from our, our use of mobile, from our use of Wi-Fi, how flaky <coughs> connectivity can continue to be. But that, again, causes a, a, a key issue. A third challenge uh, that, we've ca that we came across was the shift from legacy systems. Trying to the board of the company or the organisation see cloud as very beneficial and there's a great desire to move to the cloud. But of course, the CIO or the people that work in the department are you know, adverse, potentially, to, to a cloud environment. I mean, the same issue comes up in, in outsourcing, is, is this shift from legacy systems to the cloud environment raises questions about, firstly, what happens to the IT department, their future. It raises questions about the, you know, the machines that you have, the, the, the format in which your data is, is placed, how you shift from your legacy systems into the cloud is a challenge in and of itself. And that, as we came across in our surveys, uh, actually proved to be uh, uh, more of an issue than, than, than we anticipated. This, this shift into a new environment seemed very good, but is difficult. And finally, of course, legal and regulatory uncertainty, our, our specialism, if you like. This, this shift into uh, a new environment raises questions. Somebody has to raise the question. You go to your lawyer, you ask them, we want to move all our personnel data, our HR data, into the cloud. Can we do it? You know, you normally approach your lawyer probably about mm, 24 hours before you sign the contract. Is that right? Uh, and, of course, the lawyer's going to say what lawyers always say, which is, it depends. <laughs> which is not very useful. However, um, that shift means we have to think about all the legal and regulatory concerns. We have to c convince somebody that we have dealt with those concerns in an adequate way. So legal and regulatory uncertainty made worse as with any internet cyberspace type environment, which many of you are studying, is of course the jurisdictional uncertainty. And placing the data in the cloud, where is the cloud? You sign up to Amazon, for example, one of the leading uh, providers of cloud services. Amazon offer you, in their sign-up process, a choice. You can have a European cloud or you can have a United States cloud. So you make your choice. I go for European cloud. But, of course, this is a sign-up process. This is in their terms and conditions. And their terms and conditions, of course, allow support and service to be provided on a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, follow the sun basis, so people from Amazon anywhere in the world can get access to your data residing on a European cloud. Now, any of you that have studied data protection law will know that that's an issue. And so this legal, uh, this jurisdictional concern that arises from a cloud basis is an inevitable problem that lawyers have to confront. So, I mentioned the Commission's proposals, unleashing the potential. Well, for an unleashing, the actions being proposed by the Commission are relatively slight, I would argue. Uh, they, they propose three key actions uh, and issues that I, uh, I want to return to. The first is cutting through the jungle of standards. A lot of IT law, whether it be Creative Commons or other aspects, is about interoperability. It's about ensuring that data can move from one application to another, that applications can move from one platform to another, that infrastructure can communicate, interconnect between different infrastructures. And cloud is no different. It's dependent on standards, a whole stack of standards through the OSI model. Uh, and as with any emerging area, there is a concern about sufficiency in terms of standards. Are the standards available to allow me to move my data from one platform to another, from one software as a service application to another? Because if there aren't sufficient standards, then I have a problem. 
I've moved from a legacy system to a cloud system and I'm locked in in the same way that I would have been with my uh, legacy system. So the question of standards is, is something that the Commission wants to, uh, to, to promote. Safe and fair contract terms and conditions. Now, doesn't that sound nice? Safe and fair contract terms and conditions. <clears throat> the concern the Commission has here is, of course, a typical concern that exists in probably pretty much every part of business and industry generally. Um, terms and conditions are generally presented to you by the provider of the service and you have the choice of signing them or not signing them. Uh, the amount of contracts that are actually negotiated depend on your size, depend on your <coughs> weight, depend on your uh, ability to, to, to convince the provider to, to depart from their standard terms and conditions. And the Commission's concern is that in the cloud field, we are seeing again an imbalance, a traditional imbalance. But for some reason, the Commission's particularly concerned about the cloud imbalance. Uh, and part of this is concerns about companies, cloud providers such as Facebook. You know, if you see Facebook as a cloud provider, and, I, uh, and certainly for the purposes of our research, we saw cloud as, uh, Facebook as a cloud provider, there is a clear imbalance. You don't, or my 13-year-old son, when signing up to Facebook, didn't enter into a, a major negotiation with Facebook about the terms and conditions under which he entered into, even though he's the parent of two lawyers. He didn't even ask us. Um, so, you know, the Commission has this concern about to what extent do we have to intervene from a regulatory perspective? Do we have to intervene in, in, in terms of conditions? The third area is probably, for me, the most interesting area is about public sector leadership. And again, it's one of those quiet, unspoken areas of IT law. In fact, it's relevant to many areas of law, but from my interest, and, uh, and Maeve and myself have been uh, ploughing the furrow of IT law for far too long now, um, uh, is, is the role of the public sector. The public sector is the largest procurer of information and communications technologies. It has influence on market. It has what is known as procurement weight. And therefore, the way that public authorities exercise that procurement weight can have a fundamental impact on the way in which the market develops. I was recently in the Philippines working with the ASEAN member states, and there, Indonesia, just last month, put forward a policy that says that all Indonesian public authorities that want to go into the cloud can only go into a cloud provider that has servers based in Indonesia. So that fundamentally affects the way in which cloud services are going to be provided in that country and fundamentally affects the way in which the terms and conditions are, are being offered. And what the European Commission is saying is, let's recognise our weight and let's exercise that weight to perhaps assist in Action Plan 2 because if public procurement can impact on terms and conditions then that can filter down to individual consumers, and we all may, be, may end up with better terms and conditions as a result of, of the public procurement process. So those are the three key actions that the Commission is intending to, to engage in to promulgate cloud computing, and then it had some flanking actions, which again sounds somewhat peculiar but, but, but it's about stimulating uh, technological developments in cloud, and it's about international dialogue. One of the more impressive things about the Commission's communication was this recognition that the cloud is innately transnational. And the idea that somehow the European community can try and create a cloud environment divorced from the rest of the world is, is clearly not feasible and therefore international dialogue international dialogue between regulators, international dialogue between governments is going to be a key issue. And in which issues I want to come on and talk about now. So, I wanted to focus next on, on cloud as a regulated activity. We engage in different activities and, and, and there are regulatory environments that impact directly or indirectly on, on cloud. And the first of those I'd mention is, is telecoms law. And again, this comes from, in part, the, the ITU's interest in, in the cloud. To what extent extent is it is it a type of of uh, communication service 
other than some other type of service. And again, this is a debate that is not new to cloud. This is a debate that's raised in a number of other, in a number of other areas. The most obvious one being voice over IP. Is Skype a telephone service? Is Skype a telephone service? Is FaceTime a telephone service? What constitutes a telephone service? Skype would certainly argue they are not providing a telephone service, they're simply providing software. FaceTime, likewise, not providing a telephone service. You can communicate using that, that, that uh, application, but it's not a telephone service. They don't provide the underlying transmission. And as I said, we shouldn't forget that cloud is as dependent on networks as they are dependent on huge server farms, huge infrastructures and platforms and, uh, and remote uh, data centers. They are dependent on connectivity. And so they are dependent in part on transmission systems. And we have seen the emergence of cloud services being offered by telecoms companies. Colt, for example, uh, across Europe offers uh, a cloud service. But again, this raises a regulatory challenge. How do we treat these services? Is Facebook, a most pertinent example, a telecom service? Certainly my children, I've got two teenage boys, my two teenage boys, from their, from their perspective, that's their number one communications mechanism. They can hardly be without it. That's where they live their lives. They have no idea about the underlying transmission service that I have to pay for that allows them to spend their lives, whether it be mobile or fixed. I pay for both bills. They have no idea about that. Facebook is how they communicate. And from a regulatory perspective, that's important. If the born digital generation consider Facebook to be their communication service, then to what extent should telecommunications law and the rules promulgated under that legislation be applicable to cloud? It's an area of uncertainty. And it's a real pertinent area of uncertainty being confronted at the moment in the United Kingdom with respect to services like Facebook. The UK government has gone to Facebook and other providers of, of web-based services like, like Hotmail and Yahoo and said, you need to implement an intercept capability because increasing levels of criminality are occurring over your services and as with traditional telephony, we want an intercept capability. We want to be able to come and ask for access to content, to communications data about those committing criminal acts over your service. Facebook say, we're not providing a telephone service. Your ability to ask us to implement an intercept capability is predicated on us being a telco. We're not a telco. And that argument is an ongoing argument in the UK at the moment about what is the status of these emerging particular consumer cloud services, as whether they are actually providing communication services or whether they are something other than. The second area is, is that of consumer protection. Consumer protection is there to protect consumers from harm. So we have seen the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK already having to take action against cloud service providers who offer too much in their adverts, offer things that they can't back up. Two cases, one concerning a cloud service provider that offered unlimited storage, unlimited storage, only for £9.99 a month, unless you've got a lot of data. Because you've got a lot of data, we can't hold it. Another cloud service provider, 99.9% .9 guaranteed uptime, except the first month where you sign on where it goes down for at least 36 hours because we had a particular problem. The Advertising Standards Authority has been applying already existing rules against cloud providers. But again, the area of particular concern at the moment is, is terms of conditions. To what extent do regulators need to intervene in cloud contracts to regulate them to reflect the specificities of cloud as an environment? And again, that brings us in part back to uh, telecoms law. We have consumer protection law, and in Europe, in Ireland, in the UK, and other countries, we have telecoms consumer protection law. 
There's a recognition that there are some unique features about the nature of telecommunication services. It's utility-like nature. The dependency, dependency that we have on telecommunication services that has convinced policymakers and regulators that we need telecom-specific consumer protection rules. And the question that is being asked essentially by the Commission is, do we need the same for cloud? When the born digital generation grow up, and stop being dependent on their parents, eventually, should they have certain rights in respect to those cloud services when they become dependent? And that's part of the argument that the Commission has put forward uh, and, and, and is, is currently debated. But consumer protection law is not just about protecting consumers from harm directly. It can also be about <coughs> facilitating competition. And one of the concerns that's arisen in the cloud environment is this concern about lock-in. If I'm a Facebook user and I decide I don't want to use Facebook anymore and I want to use Google+, how do I transfer my data? Very, very difficult. And that very, very difficult bit is actually a fundamental barrier to market entry and market competition. Again, going back to telecoms law, that was a problem in telecoms law. We had all these new competing operators in the telecoms market, but if you couldn't take your telephone number with you, could you be bothered? Answer, nah. So, in telecoms law, they introduced this concept of number portability, and that concept of number portability was all about facilitating demand-led competition in the telecoms market. And, again, there's been considerations in the cloud market about the need to have some sort of right of data portability. It's arisen particularly in the context of data protection, which I'll come on to in a moment. But this concept that we should have the right to shift our data. If we can't move our data, then we will be locked in to particular service providers, and that will be to our disadvantage. Data protection is inevitably highly pertinent to cloud computing. And we've done a number of papers, far too many papers, uh, on the data protection implications of, of cloud. And I can only touch on a few of those aspects, and I know others will, 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 will touch on it as well. When I place my data in the cloud, and my cloud provider encrypts that data, or I place encrypted data in the cloud, is that data personal? What we've seen over recent years, we would argue, is, is a, as a broadening of the concept of personal data. Personal data has now become much more data than it was ever envisaged when data protection law was first adopted. And the implications that has for a cloud environment is to what extent does the platform as a service, does the Amazons who provide infrastructure as a service, to what extent are they processing personal data through virtualized machines in applications in which they have no realistic ability to identify individuals. We've looked at this concept of personal data and perhaps the need for data protection law to recognize a middle way between data, personal data and not personal data. Perhaps there's a need to recognize that there is, there is personal data to which Really, there is no realistic uh, possibility of gaining access, and therefore the regulatory burden should perhaps be reduced. We've looked at the problem of distinguishing between controllers and processors. Again, a distinction that's become increasingly blurred in a cloud environment where I place <coughs> my data with Apple iCloud, for example. That Apple iCloud resides on Amazon infrastructure, both services are essentially free to me. The commercial deal that underpins that, that, that deal is essentially their ability to use my metadata, the data about my activities, to, to advertise to me, to, to sell analytical data for the purposes of other advertisers and commercial communications. The boundaries between what constitutes a controller and a processor have become worn thin. Because of time, and I know others are going to touch on this, I'll, I'll move on. Cloud has started to raise traditional competition issues. Amazon is the de facto market leader in the cloud environment. And we are already seeing cloud 
uh, Amazon's APIs becoming the de facto standard for interoperability between different platforms. And that in itself has raised competition concerns to the extent that which Amazon, similar to other marketplaces, Google and their search engine, Microsoft and its operating system, may become, through you know, the principle of the, uh, of the network effect, become essentially an incumbent or dominant operator in this marketplace. Last year, in public procurement, Google successfully against the United States Interior Department who were engaged in a public procurement process whereby they asked they were procuring out or they were, they were asking for, for service providers to provide an email system but based on Microsoft's business productivity suite and Google successfully got that public procurement process halted on the basis that by the government choosing to use Microsoft as the basis for their email service, they were ex essentially excluding Google from a, from a very lucrative market. And finally, in terms of regulated concerns, we have environmental concerns. And again, the Commission has raised this in its recent communication. These dent data centres provide great efficiencies from the user's perspective, but they are huge consumers of energy. And the Commission has noted the concern that we need to, to reflect that usage of energy in, in, in environmental uh, policy. Uh, we need to have adequate metrics to be able to measure the scale of these operations uh, and uh, ensure that uh, we minimise the carbon footprint of some of these particular uh, processes. And finally, jurisdictional concerns. As I said, cloud is innately international in nature and that gives rise to questions about transfers, transferring data in and out of jurisdiction. It gives rise to questions about oversight and enforcement. How can, is my point about compliance as a service, how can I as the data protection regulator in the United Kingdom ensure that the data when transferred into the cloud continues to be subject to my oversight, my enforcement? And those challenges are very real at the moment. Cloud security, I, I mentioned this is a, is a key issue. Um, questions about information ownership have been fairly... Uh, is one of those myths that has arisen in the cloud field. People concerned that if I give you my data, I will somehow lose ownership rights over that data. The evidence that we've uh, obtained suggests that that's not a real concern, that, that generally standard terms and conditions leave information and ownership with the, the provider of the data. But we have seen some unique experiments in trying to address security concerns in respect of, of information ownership. In a Swiss canton, you know Switzerland's covered in nuclear bunkers. End of Cold War, what do you do with your nuclear bunker? Fill it with servers. And fill it with servers offering cloud services and this particular Swiss con canton saw there was an opening. How can, can we convince governments around the world, particularly governments in, in Africa, to place their data in the cloud on servers based in Switzerland? I know, we'll recognise that a particular server, rack is subject to diplomatic immunity. We will actually make that server rack because we have the right as a Swiss canton to grant diplomatic immunity so we will actually give diplomatic immunity to a server rack so it will become subject to the law of the country from which the data came so we've really seen some great innovation where countries are prepared to uh, sacrifice or, or, or um, erode national sovereignty to facilitate transfer of data into their territory Finally, I wanted to mention on cloud security, because I know I'm running out of time, is, is uh, what has become known as the Patriot Act problem, which is linked to this, this, this transfer concern. And it's, it's arisen particularly in Europe, this concern that all of the major cloud providers are US companies. And in the US, you have this law called the USA Patriot Act, which is an acronym for a very, very long title. And the concern put forward is... And it's a concern that the Commission has, that uh, the European Parliament at the moment is discussing is, 
How do we protect the rights of European citizens where European organisations place data in the cloud and that data is accessible to US law enforcement because that data is residing in the United States? How do we protect European citizens? Well, this is another issue that we have looked at as part of our research. And of course, it's not, in fact, it's called the Patriot Act problem, but it's not unique to the United States. We have similar laws in the United Kingdom, you have similar laws in Ireland, which do allow the transnational access to data residing in computers in, in different jurisdictions. It's a particular US problem at the moment because most of the data resides in the US. But as data centres get established in Europe, and Ireland is a very successful uh, uh, jurisdiction for the establishment of data centres, the cross-border access of law enforcement to data is a problem faced by all jurisdictions. And although I won't speak about it further at the moment, we can talk about it in the questions. Finally, finally, contract terms. We did a survey of, of um, some 32 uh, sets of terms and conditions, uh, a thoroughly interesting read. Um, and of course, what, what we found was essentially those terms and conditions reflected the legacy of the company that provides the service. If it was a telco moving into the cloud environment, the terms and conditions looked and smelt very much like telco terms. Software company. You know, Microsoft is the biggest example of a com company undergoing a cultural shift. Last year, it earned $32 billion from selling licenses. But now, it has to be a cloud service company. Now it has to sell $4 a month, Office 365. That's a cultural shift, and that's got to be reflected in their contractual terms and conditions. And so... We noticed that all you could tell, we could do, we did blind testing. How fun are we? Uh, we did blind testing where we would get students to read terms and conditions and try and guess what type of company was providing the cloud service. And they got quite good at it. This is a telco, this is a software company, this is a hardware company, this is an outsourcing company, this is an aggregator. You can always tell when it's an aggregator because they always offer most, because they have least. And the only way they can get the customers is to offer more because they have least. We've also done a survey of negotiated contracts. We've interviewed lots of companies, lots and lots of companies, and we are seeing a lot of negotiation going on. And the types of areas where negotiation are occurring are the issues I've mentioned there. Data preservation, data integrity, data disclosure, <coughs> location, 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 location. These issues are being negotiated. And, and from our perspective, for the, for the Commission to talk about these contracts being insufficiently specific and balanced, you know, that claim could be made against you know, many, many products and services currently available to us. The market is too immature, we would say, for, for, for intervention in the marketplace. But the Commission is already talking about the possibility of model contracts and regula regulatory intervention. And with that, I'll finish. So thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs>